Hello, everyone. I'll put on my clock just so that I don't go over time. All right. So my presentation is titled Wireless Telephone Agency Materiality, Making of the Modern National Auditory in Turkey. I'm going to present you today a work in progress, so questions and comments are welcome. Uh, my presentation focuses on the novelty years of the wireless technology, or radio, in Turkey. Wireless technology arrived in Turkey in the 1920s, during when Turkey was in a process of nation-state formation. So both the new nation and new technology were in a process of construction, adjustment, and contention. So drawing on this context, in my presentation, I ask two research questions. The first one is, how does a new nation state shape beliefs about what technological objects can and should do? Second, how do these beliefs help fashion a national community of listeners? Today, the wireless is normalized as a broadcast medium of radio, but in its early days, this course was not quite clear. Apart from being a broadcast medium, in the 1920s, the wireless telephone, as people in Turkey called it, could also be used as a point-to-point two-way communication medium. As a newly established nation-state in 1923, Turkish state elites wanted to control this second function for security purposes. Therefore, the ruling elites first established this state state monopoly over the use and construction of transmitters to control the function of point-to-point -point communication. Then they officially introduced the wireless as a broadcast medium by supporting the foundation of a private radio station in 1927, four years after the establishment of the Republic. The company radio, as the newspapers of the era named it, remained active for 10 years until 1937. In my presentation, I examine this 10-year period of company radio as a critical period for laying down the material and symbolic infrastructure that formed the national community of listeners later in the post-1937 period. In order to understand what rendered this period critical for the formation of national listeners, I suggest shifting the attention away from the content of the radio broadcasts to the wireless as a technical object. I suggest such a shift because due to financial and technical difficulties, the company radio was sometimes silent for weeks and never had sufficient economic or technical background to prepare a consistent program content. Partly because of this situation, the company radio broadcasts received more critiques than praise, and at the end of its 10-year period, the government decided to shut it down and opened a completely state-owned nationalized radio station in 1937 in Ankara. This radio in Ankara, since 1937, designed, to, designed as a tool to imagine the Turkish nation, and to experiment with the contents of the authentic Turkish culture, as Maltam Ağızka eloquently observes. The company radio broadcast may have failed to be the voice of the nation in terms of its content, but I suggest that its 10-year period was in fact critical for laying down the material and symbolic infrastructure that produced the national community of listeners in the post-1937 period, uh, when the national radio was uh, founded. In my talk, I will go over two factors that rendered this period critical. First, I argue that the foundation of a radio station in, in 1927 played an important role to accelerate the circulation of technical knowledge about the wireless technology. Such knowledge circulation then helped the public to assemble their own radio receivers, in less costly ways, and in so doing, furnish the public with tools and skills necessary to receive official message messages later. Second, I show that this period was also critical for public to negotiate the symbolic meanings of the receivers and transmitters that are the components of the wireless communication in ways that wouldn't threaten the sovereignty of the new nation state. The public accounts portrayed receivers as easy to assemble and experiment with for everyone, but they depicted transmitters as objects that can be built by experts and used by disciplined and trained people. 
In fact, similar to receivers, experimenting with transmitters was also possible for the public because there was this group called radio amateurs who were experimenting with transmitters as well, but this option was sidelined. Such contrasting portrayals of transmitters and receivers regulate the public's approach to transmitters in a way that partly created the community of national listeners well equipped to receive, only to receive and assimilate official messages later in the post-1937 period. In the last portion of my talk, I turn to Turkey's radio amateurs' approach to transmitters, who illegally experimented with transmitters because it was banned in Turkey. And I look at their accounts of how they, you know, uh, relate to transmitters, how they approach to transmitters, in order to question the symbolic how symbolic representation of technological objects shape the conditions of agency in media practice. And I end my talk by making some remarks about this interaction between agency and materiality and how then we can actually look at digital media, today's new media, from this type of interaction. Uh, in order to address these points and questions, I follow the paper trail left by the wireless technology in Turkey and base my analysis on archival research at radio periodicals that were, that were published in the 1920s and the 1930s, such as TASIS, Radio Amateur, SES, Radio Programme, Radio Aleme. Among radio magazines, TASIS, which means wireless in English, it has a special place in my analysis uh, because uh, it is the first radio magazine that was published in Turkey in 1927. So it's an important witness to Turkey's early moment, early encounter with the wireless technology. I also examine oral history interviews with people who were radio amateurs in the 1940s, 50s and the 60s. For the ones who are not familiar, radio amateurs refer to technology enthusiasts who experiment with radio technology by assembling transmitters and receivers to communicate with other amateurs. Since individual use and construction of transmitters were banned in Turkey, um, they were doing this illegally and amateurship is important for my analysis because it shows that public can experiment with assembling transmitters similar to receivers. But this option was not mentioned in these magazines as I will go into the details later. Okay, so Turkey's first radio station, it was established in 1927 after the state gave the right to carry out wireless broadcasts to the Turkish wireless telephone company for 10 years. The company radio period is critical for the formation of the national listeners because it accelerated the technical knowledge about the receivers. After the establishment, the company radio owners observed that they had no audience, so they gave a three-week course on how to assemble receivers to a group of people so that this group of people were going to go to their neighborhoods in order to teach other people how to assemble receivers and how to adjust antennas. So for them, teaching how to assemble receivers was the quickest way to create a radio audience. The company owners knew that they were addressing an economically impoverished citizenry. The war that founded the Republic ended just four years ago, and most citizens wouldn't have been afforded to buy radio devices. Therefore, teaching them how to assemble receivers was the easiest option to popularize radio. The company radio continued sharing knowledge about how to assemble receivers through a magazine called TASIS, again, as I said, this means wireless. Uh, the magazine was published in 18 issues between June and November 1927. In its third issue, TASIS gives instructions for assembling a simple receiver with the title, the cheapest handset can be made for about five to 5.5 liras. At the time, one issue of TASIS cost 6.5 liras, whereas one radio machine costs around 200 liras. So you can see the price difference between them. The word handset refers here to a receiver with a telephone attached, and in the article, telephone refers to the earphones. So this device is for individual listening only. In the sixth issue, the magazine explains how to build receiver with receivers with lamps, because if you have a receiver with lamp, then you can hear signals from far more distant places. Other radio magazines that were published in the 1930s continue this editorial line. For example, the magazine SES that was published in 1932 has this information about how to assemble bobbins with really emboldening, encouraging titles such as you can build your own bobbins yourself. And later this technical information becomes Theoretical, in addition to being practical, so the magazines start explaining what is radio, and they start from the very basic knowledge about 
for instance, de describing electrons first in order to show people how it works. Although some of these magazines openly address radio amateurs, the language in the technical descriptions is very emboldening in a way that invites everyone to follow the instructions to put together their receivers. I'm reading a passage in the fifth issue of the Talsis magazine here. In order to give a good description of how to put together a handset that is a receiver, we will of course share with you the instructions about the most simple and primitive handset. If you are good with your hands, you can put together a working handset immediately after you read our instruction and listen to the Osmania concerts. Osmania is where the transmitter was located. The reason why we write this column is that we would like to show you how this mind-blowing invention that is radio in fact consists of very simple components. Such descriptions are very empowering, inviting even the readers with no knowledge on electronics to assemble their own receivers. The Talsis magazine editors are adamant in showing that although a technology such as radio might seem mysterious, it has these basic components that everyone can put together. It's of course hard to judge the readership of these magazines. There are reader letters in the magazines um, that mostly ask about the technical details about how to fix problems, how to put together, you know, how to work certain receiver schemes. They send their schemes to the editors to, in order to get answers. But again, it isn't, these letters are not enough to understand the extent to which these magazines reached out to the public. Yet, it is also possible to approach the importance given to sharing this information as symptomatic of a rising trend of assembling receivers in that era. In fact, my oral history interviews with amateur, amateurs confirmed, that, confirmed the existence of such a trend and in fact showed that assembling radio receivers rather than purchasing manufactured devices continued into the 1940s, 50s and the 60s. An amateur named Emin, who was born in 1935 in Chorum, and lived there until his university years. Chorum is a city in the middle of the country. It's kind of a peripheral place, a rural place, if you will. And he was, he was growing up there in the 40s. And he said that the first ever radio they, they had in their house was the radio with Galena, Galani radio, his father himself put together. And when I asked him, how did your father learn about putting together a radio receiver? He said that it's the neighbors who taught him how to put together this receiver. So then he added that it wasn't very affordable for everyone to buy a radio. So what we did was we, there was this trend of assembling radio devices in the neighborhood. Then it shows that the circulation of technical knowledge through radio magazines took another form later as people themselves taught each other how to assemble receivers. Another radio amateur grew up in a village of Rize, again in the northern part of the country, but not that urbanized. Similarly, he said that in the village they had only one receiver and his first personal receiver was again the receiver that he himself assembled together. So as amateurs, narratives and content of radio magazines highlight, before the voices on the radio broadcast took an undeniably nationalist form in 1937 with the foundation of the national radio, Turkey's public encountered the wireless as a technology, as an object requiring certain technical knowledge and skills. Radio devices were more accessible when they were assembled rather than purchased. And the cultivation of sufficient technical skills to assemble and repair receivers. Here, I couldn't really go into the repairing part, but in these radio magazines, there are also, also menus about how to repair commonly um, encountered problems, such as burnt lamps, for instance. And given the situation of technology in that era, the wireless technology was still in the making, the devices carried noise as much as signal, so even if you have a manufactured device, you still needed to have some technical knowledge and skills in order to be able to adjust your device or in order to be able to continue using your manufactured device. So cultivation of these skills then played an important role in the emergence of the community of national listeners. And if the national radio was able to reach out to more people after 1937, it was due in part to this initial period of people familiarizing themselves and experimenting with wireless technology. So this is the part about receivers. When it comes to transmitters, radio magazines in the 1920s and the 1930s, especially the very early ones, such as TASIS, contributed to the control imposed by the transmitter ban by sharing technical knowledge about receiver construction only. 
As the examples I gave highlight, these magazines offered an abundance of instruction about how to assemble receivers, what was lacking in their pages, however, was the information that people or amateurs similarly experimented with transmitters. When transmitters were mentioned, they were rather represented in the periodicals as large constructions produced by experts such as engineers. Tarsus, for example, represents transmitters mostly as grandiose structures. In the section called Wireless Telephone News, the editors usually inform the public about the new radio stations built in Europe. Here they emphasize the large size of these transmitters with titles such as the Neve and Grand English Station. When describing a newly built station in Germany, for example, the editors give detailed information about how engineers built this large structure by including a picture, picture on your left is this transmitter's antenna in Germany. And Turkey's Osmaniye transmitter station is frequently represented in these magazines. And on the right, you see uh, this antenna of Turkey's transmitter in Osmaniye. And one of these pictures is very interesting. It's again the antenna in the Osmaniye uh, transmitter. It is taken underneath the 135 meters long antenna and the reader experiences the transmitter from the, from the viewpoint of a person looking up. So it almost uh, magnifies the impact of the um, um, transmitter itself. So these pictures and other depictions published in Tassis point to a cultural debate that assigns a particular image to the transmitters. The implication here is that transmission is done through these grandiose constructs that require the expert knowledge of engineers. And here we do not see the emboldening tone that we see in the receiver construction. These contrasting portrayals exclude the fact that there are radio amateurs who are experimenting with these um, with transmitters, but as I said, this is not even mentioned. And TASIS also helps to fix the symbolic logic of transmitters by um, describing more mi miniature details of transmission in a way that I call as unca uncanny, such as microphones, for instance. In a column that describes how a microphone works to public, the editor suggests that the microphone is similar to a person whose sleep is very light. So when people around the microphone, they become silent and warn each other to be silent as well. The column starts with two people silencing each other. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Exclamation points, question marks, that they, they become silent immediately. And the author plays this game with the reader asking, okay, who these people are around? Or what are they around? Why do you think they are so afraid of speaking? And then, you know, continues playing the game for a while. And now he says, okay, okay, you are getting impatient. I'm going to give you the answer. And that's how the author gives the answer. Right, the radio microphone. So these people are around the radio mic microphone, exclamation point. Even when it is preoccupied, I'm quoting Tassi's magazine here, even when it is preoccupied, it hears a strongly taken breath, even if it was only one breath, and immediately transfers it to far away places. So the people working with the microphone speak to each other by warning each other to be silent as the uh, entry of the passage highlighted. They have become speechless unwillingly. In fact, the warnings on the studio walls constantly warn and summon these people to do so. Normally, we think of the microphone as something that extends people's voices, just like Marshall McLuhan suggested media extension of people, right? So here, however, the microphone is described as something that silences its users rather than extending their voices. In fact, by its capacity to extend people's voices, the microphone invites people around it to be silent. For the Tassis editors, the microphone is a very sensitive device, a dangerously neutral mediator that conveys anything that it catches. The nature of the microphone then obliges people to behave, rendering the microphone something that controls rather than is controlled. The microphone then is not for everyone. It is only for those who have sufficient capacity to discipline themselves around it. Uh, and this kind of disciplining um, is also implied in the warning signs on the wall. Then this is the, this is the contrast to the receivers because unlike receivers, the transmitters are uncanny due to, their such, due to their such uncontrollable capacity of conveying sounds. 
Together with the emphasis put on expert knowledge to construct transmitters, the descriptions fortify the impression that sound transmission is not for everyone. Interestingly, the symbolic construction of the wireless transmission in the 1920s and the 1930s as something that requires discipline and control has some parallels with Turkey's radio amateurs' approach to transmitters in the 1950s and the 1960s. So radio amateurship, as I said, in the 1920s and the 1930s was reduced to experimenting with receivers only, but beginning in the 1940s, uh, people more openly started to uh, experiment with transmitters. This was partly as a result of the shift toward multi-party politics, where the governing party relaxed the um, regulations on transmission building a little bit, but still individual use and construction of transmitters were banned, but probably this atmosphere ga gave some hope to people to do this more openly. And the transmitter construction was banned in Turkey until 1983, so that was a very long period. But given that the individual use of transmitters was forbidden, the amateurs in Turkey illegally experimented with transmitters, and during our interviews, they felt a need to justify their illegal hobby of assembling transmitters by defining themselves as well-intentioned people or good boys who know how to behave politically around transmitters or who know how to discipline themselves around the microphone just like it is implied by the Tassis magazine's depiction of the microphone. Orhan, an amateur who was born in 1947, describes his experiences of being an amateur in the 1950s and the 60s with the following words. The furthest location I could speak to was Italy because the transmitter I was able to assemble could reach out that far in distance. I couldn't develop myself further because some things have happened to us. Başımızdan bir hikaye geçti. There was a wireless law that banned assembling transmitters. We broke the ban because we were well-intentioned people. What was wrong with what we did? I spent one and a half months in jail. After that, I quitted amateurship. The radio amateurship is something that's beneficial. We should help the youth to engage with such beneficial activities. We didn't get engaged with other things back then, such as political fractions. Most students were part of these fractions. We stayed away from them. Our passion was amateurship. Here, Orhan describes himself as being a well-intentioned person to justify his quote-unquote illegal hobby. Other amateurs define themselves as good boys, a phrase that resonates with what Orhan describes as well-intentioned person. Good boys or iyi çocuk in Turkish is a phrase used by state officials in Turkey to equip individuals who have been involved in illegal acts but did so for the national cause. Despite his good intentions, Orhan was arrested in the politically contentious atmosphere of the 1960s. During the 1960s, the leftist socialist movement was very strong in Turkey with various um, political fractions, as Orhan also mentioned, active in the field. Labor unions were strong and the streets frequently witnessed public protests. This atmosphere culminated in a military coup in 1971, and in this period, radio amateurs became political suspects due to their involvement with the wireless technology. However, Orhan distinguishes himself and other amateurs from, this, from the political fractions in his words of the time by defining amateurship as a useful hobby that in fact prevents the youth from getting involved in harmful politics. In so doing, he implies that he submits to the norms of the nation state by defining himself apolitical or properly political. In Orhan's words, we see an image of an amateur who can control themselves when using transmitters with their well intentions and who know how to behave around transmitters, just like the Telsiz magazine implies when inviting experts and people who can control themselves to do the job of the transmission. Here, I do not suggest that the symbolic representation of the transmitters in the Telsiz magazine informed radio amateurs' approach to transmitters. In the politically contentious atmosphere of the 1960s, aligning with the national norms might have also seem the safer option for radio amateurs. It is, however, also interesting to observe that even when the practice of transmitting sound is done illegally, in a way that suggests a moment of resistance to the state and the law, it can be submitting to the very norms that order the communication field. I suggest such subordination around transmitters, as also implied by the Tatsis magazine, is similar to the type of passivity necessary to form a national community of listeners. 
When they are using transmitters, amateurs act like the proper members of the national auditory. Here I take this case to ask questions about materiality and agency during new media moments. Can we approach amateurs' subordination to national norms when using transmitters as a symptom of the passive mode of listening necessary to form a national community of listeners who are ready to receive and assimilate messages? If we follow this line of explanation, what role do the meanings attached to technological objects such as receivers and transmitters play in shaping the conditions of agency when listening to, for example, radio? Critical scholarship suggests that listening in and of itself is not passive. There are rather processes that turn it into passive receptivity. In his famous essay, The Storyteller, Walter Benjamin, for example, describes that in pre-modern times, people were more active listeners because pre-modern storytellers left the counsel or the moral of the story open-ended, leaving it to the listener to interpret things the way they understood them. Benjamin highlights, highlights that the shift toward capitalist press informed the rise of information, and the very nature of information divests listening from its agentive dimensions or from its active components. Unlike pre-modern stories, it, it, the information is understandable in itself. It is shot through with explanation, so the addressee has a very little room for interpretation, hence active engagement with the material. Benjamin here points to the nature of the mes message or the content that is information as a process that cultivates a passive mode of listening. I question if meanings attached to technological objects, such as receivers and transmitters, similarly cultivate listening as passive receptivity. In the novelty years of the wireless technology, whereas the receivers were portrayed as easy to assemble for everyone, the transmitters were described as requiring expert knowledge. These portrayals both prepare and equip people to receive messages, while at the same time inviting them to be careful and at times silent when it comes to sending these messages. In other words, the contrasting meanings attributed to the transmitters and the receivers prepare people to receive messages, but message sending process becomes something tense and emotionally laden. In addition to content, then I suggest that we should also include in the picture how in the novelty years people made sense of these technological objects and how these meanings of these objects inform the conditions of agency. And this is the last part of my talk that I want to use this interaction between agency and material to make some remarks about today's digital media. If we think about the interaction between material and agency within the context of digital media, we actually have a different perspective about the ideologies of agencies surrounding today's new media. With the expansion of digital platforms, new terms such as prosumer has celebrated technology users newly attained capacity to create media content. As you all know, most public accounts describe the newness brought by digital technologies as the interactive features of digital platforms that turned people into active content producers, or like they, they use terms such as prosumer. But if we shift the focus away from content to the very materiality, we see that the technological object of today's digital media is in fact hidden in a black box. It is not even possible to have the smartphones for example, repaired, unless you go to one of the underground technology uh, repair shops, as the tech giants keep the hardware a secret. Today's digital media users may seem to be using their creativity in content production, but they are limited in their command of the hardware. This is a contrast to the period uh, of the wireless technology, since users back then could experiment technically with receivers and to some extent with transmitters. Such comparisons between media novelty moments and those us with the capacity to ask more compelling research questions about agency in media practice. And I end my talk with this question. If it was possible to invite media users to experiment with the technological object in the beginning of the 20th century, what are the larger ideological frameworks that rendered hardware a black box today in a way that channels creativity and experimentation to content production? That's it. Thank you so much for your patience.